Plotinus, the one. Now, there are many ways of reading Plotinus because he's so rich. So I have selected a particular way of going for tonight. And what I'd like to do is focus on these three quotes. This is the way Plotinus talks about the subject he is going to explore. He talks about it in terms of the effect this kind of study has on the person who participates in it. Notice the language. The participant in this game fears it will encounter nothingness. The mind reels at this. And then this proviso that the initiate is forbidden to speak of this subject. These are the three things. Now, why he has these expressions, which are principal expressions of the way he looks at this subject, I hope to make clear by leading you into what may in fact be, in some small measure, an encounter with nothingness. Perhaps your mind will reel at what this is all about. And perhaps you will see then why this very subject is the highest subject and uh, the initiate is forbidden to speak of it. Therefore, I'm going to take you through Plotinus on the one as a yoga or a spiritual discipline. I'm going to focus on several sections. Each of these is in Plotinus, section one, four, now, let me see whether we can make it clear. This is the goal. That's where we're going. He first gives a discussion in the first section on the nature of the one. Then he's going to build in a series of steps to why the idea of the one must be beyond knowledge. It must be beyond knowledge. It must be beyond intelligence. However, while it must be beyond it, it must be seen. It must be encountered. It must be seen, because that's the second step in our yoga. There are two parts that we're going to uncover, two major sections. One, after having seen the intelligence, then the process is going to the one. The other, of course, is getting to whatever this is called the intelligence. He's going to urge us to go through a yoga a spiritual discipline through being. As we've discovered before, talked about many times, the idea of intelligence is a three concept, right? capital B, being. Right? Vitality. These three are always hyphenated, though for different reasons he may focus on one of the three when he has a need for that. Right? Now there's a need to conceive both of intelligence and the one. That's part of the yoga. Once you get to see this, what? Being able to conceive it in his language, then this expression comes up. We're going to reel at this. The mind is going to reel at this because it's a much more interesting advanced contemplation. Now, I'd like to therefore just talk about the idea, before we go further, idea of the one. 
There's one very interesting idea of the one. Um, everything, regardless of what it is. Um, actually, it's a very lovely quote. Let me read it for you. Everything that whatever is, anything at all, chalk, box, you and I, a cat, whatever. Right? Everything, if it is at all, there must be a one about it because there must be a union of all of its parts. Therefore, it exhibits a unitary organization. And that unity, or oneness, is actually proportional. It's, he puts it in a very nice way. Each thing that is called the one has a unity proportionate to its nature, sharing in unity, the more or less, according to the degree of its being. So therefore, this can be anything at all, whatever it might be. The degree to which you can talk about it being a one is that it has a unity. That unity is proportionate to its being. Therefore, you can talk about an orchestra, each person an individual, highly trained, can come together to work together towards a higher goal, the harmony and the artful presentation of a piece. They're achieving a higher unity than any mob can do. And therefore, they have proportionally, they can be said to share in a greater degree of being. What is being? Ah, they're participating in a greater degree of intelligence. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> So in the same way, they would be exhibiting a certain kind of state of mind. They'd have to maintain a certain state of mind to reach that level of artful presentation. That state of mind is a state of being through which they participate in the intelligence of a Beethoven sonata, whatever it, is, whatever it is that's being played. And as a consequence, they experience a certain kind of vitality. Therefore, whatever one is, when any one you're talking about, the particular unitariness of it or oneness of it is proportionate to the level of its being. So therefore we can go for all physical appearances, whatever it might be, and we can apply that one principle to it. Now, um, the big thing therefore is that being, right now here, being is not the one. Being is not the one. Because you can talk about this, you can talk about this in these terms. And therefore, to talk about this, whatever this is, presupposes that you need these three concepts brought together into a unity. Therefore, whatever this is, it has these aspects. It has these aspects, then obviously then you're making distinctions. If you're making distinctions in something, then you have a unity of these distinctions brought together in a oneness, and that is not the one without all distinctions and without any multiplicity, whatever. Now, where we're going is, we're going to talk about what is it like to encounter this? This is where we're going. Right. So, as our spiritual voyage goes on, we want to know, what is it like to be here? Right. Well, we'll get some very fine descriptions of that, but the experience itself is called beauty itself. Or sometimes it's called the perfection of beauty. Now, it doesn't tell us yet too much about the nature of this kind of beauty that is experienced. And we need a good description of that. We'll get that in a short while. Right? Now, if therefore intelligence, being, and vitality experience as the per perfection of beauty is a multiplicity, and if you can know this, and since you can know this as a multiplicity, this is also the nature of knowledge to Plotinus and the Platonic tradition. That's what knowledge is, right? And in that, you can make claims. You can make claims about it without qualification. It does not admit of degrees. 
that is possible to know it. Ah, but then if that thing which you're knowing is a multiplicity and it's not the one, then the one must transcend knowledge, right? The one must then transcend. And that sense of beyond, totally beyond it, in any respect, it's that beyond it in any respect we're going to use in a short while. Well then, what is it like therefore to experience that? And what is it like? Because after you've seen it, then you have to go on to the one. So we'd like to see two things. One is what kind of experience or what kind of preparation for that experience is required and what is it in itself. So I'd like to read a few lines of Plotinus. I use the uh, O'Brien translation uh, quite a bit, Thomas Taylor, but uh, O'Brien is just very beautiful, so I, I enjoy reading it. problem in even reading Plotinus says I might enjoy it and keep reading. <laughs> Duality is implied if the intelligent is both thinker and thought. It's not simple, therefore it's not the one. If the intelligence contemplates some object other than itself, then certainly there exists something superior to the intelligence. If the intelligence contemplates itself and at the same time that which is superior to it, it will still be only of secondary rank. Therefore, we must conceive the intelligence as is enjoying the presence of the good and the one and contemplating it while it is also present to itself, it thinks itself and thinks itself as being all things constituting such a diversity, the intelligence is far from the one. Therefore, the soul must advance into the formless. As the soul advances towards the formless, unable to grasp what is without contour and to receive the imprint of reality, it fears it will encounter nothingness and it slips away. Its state is distressing. It seeks solace in retreating down to the sense realm. Now this is a contemplation. It's quite common, therefore, when people are in the game of contemplating, that they reach that very state where you're reaching a formless, and there's nothing to hold on to. And the whole idea of the ego and your own personality becomes vague and slips away from you. And you look around and you say, I wonder what I'm doing here. Maybe I should get out of this state of mind. That is the state that he's talking about. Therefore, the soul must then seek to know in its own way See, that's the transition. The soul must seek to know in its own way, by unification. It's prevented by that unification from recognizing that it's found it. Nevertheless, a philosophical study of the one must follow, because that's what the soul seeks. The one, it would look upon is the source of all reality, namely, the good and the one. It must not withdraw from the primal realm and sink down. Rather, it must withdraw from sense objects, turn to the highest, must free itself from all evil, since it aspires to rise to the good. 
it must rise to the principle possessed within itself, and from the multiplicity that it was, it must again become one. Only in this way can it contemplate the supreme principle, the one. Now, having become the intelligence, having entrusted itself to it, committed itself to it, having confided and established itself in it, so that by alert concentration the soul may grasp all the intelligence sees, it will, by the intelligence, contemplate the one. Without employing the senses, without mingling perception, it must contemplate this purest of objects through the purest of the intelligence, through that which is supreme in the intelligence. What must it do? It must go through the intelligence to contemplate the one. Hmm. It must contemplate what's prior to the intelligence. The one then is not the intelligence, but higher. Intelligence is still a being while the one is not a being. As the one begets all things, it cannot be any of them. Therefore, we must go beyond knowledge and hold to unity. To obtain the vision is solely the work of him who desires to obtain it. If he doesn't arrive at contemplation, if his soul doesn't achieve awareness of that life that is beyond, if the soul does not feel a rapture within it like that of the lover coming to rest in his, his love, if because of his closeness to the one he receives its true light, his whole soul made luminous, but is still weighted down with his vision, frustrated, if he doesn't rise alone, but still carries within him something alien to the one, if he is not yet sufficiently unified, if he has not yet risen far but is still at a distance, either because of the obstacles to which we, must, we have spoken of or because of lack of such instruction as would give him a direction and a faith in the existence of the things beyond, he has no one to blame but himself. No. And should try to become pure by detaching himself from everything. Okay, I want to go back. Because of the closeness to the one, because of the closeness to the one, because of the closeness to the one, he receives, he receives, it's light. This is the luminous radiance, right? Sometimes called divine luminosity, right? Because, because he's now getting near the one, which is intelligence, he experiences this luminous radiance, divine luminosity. That is this. The highest part of the intelligence, sometimes called the vestibule before the one itself. Sometimes it's called the portals before the chamber. It's had various names, but it's a splendor. This is the beauty we were talking about before. This is the perfection of beauty. This is what he calls it. What is it? It's the divine luminosity, radiance. Is it the one? No. What is it? It's as you get close to the one. Because of his closeness to the one, he receives its true light, his whole soul made luminous. And here is the tension in many mystical systems and spiritual systems and philosophical systems. Many systems want to call this the ultimate state. This is bliss, this is ecstasy found in this. Plotinus is going to go beyond that here. Well, what does that mean? You have to go beyond ecstasy, you gotta go beyond beauty, you gotta go beyond this? Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, directly from what I just read, I'm going to read the next line. The one is absent from nothing and from everything. It is present only to those who are prepared for it and who are able to receive it. Right? It's always there, right? There's nowhere else. It's present only to those who are prepared for it and are able to receive it, to enter into harmony with it, to grasp and touch it, and by virtue of their likeness to it, by virtue of that inner power similar to and stemming from the one, when it is in that state in which it was when it originated from the one, thus it will be able to see the one, right? Thus will the one be seen. That's the condition to become the object of contemplation of the one itself. Hey, anyone lacks faith in these arguments should consider the following. Let me do that again. Okay. It's present only to those who are prepared for it, able to receive it, to enter into harmony with it. Okay, you're going to enter into harmony. You are going to enter into harmony with it. Relationship. To grasp and touch it by virtue of their likeness to it, by virtue of the inner power, similar to and stemming from the one. See, it's similar to and it's stemming from the one. It's not the one. When it is in that state in which it was when it originated from the one, thus the one to be seen as far as it can be, must become the object of contemplation. Right? That's the transition from here to here. That's the transition. We want to take a look at it now. Um, What he is now saying is that we go through the intelligence to grasp the one. That's it. It is through the intelligence. It's through the intelligence. It's through that state. And the Bhagavad Gita, this is the highest state, right? The sun. Right, that experience of Arjuna in the 11th book, in the 11th chapter, um, is a divine radiance, much like 10,000 suns coming into the heavens all at once. His is a yoga through being, and therefore there's going to be a need to, to conceive it, to, to conceive this. Because if you're going to go through it, you ought to know what you're going through, right? right. These men then should apply themselves to the study of, of soul, learning other things, that it proceeds from the intelligence and attains excellence or virtue by participating in the reason that proceeds from the intelligence. Next they must realize that the intelligence is different from our faculty of reasoning. Reasoning implies discursive steps. They must see that knowledge consists in the manifestation of rational forms that exist in the soul and come to the soul from the intelligence. It's the source of knowledge. After one has seen the intelligence, is immediately perceived one must think of it as quiet, unwavering movement, embracing all things, being all things in its multiplicity, both divisible and indivisible. This multitude, multiplicity of, of coexisting beings, uh, the intelligent realm is near the one. See, you're getting near the one. Nevertheless, it's not the one. It's not supreme because the intelligence is neither one nor simple. The one is the source of all things. It's simple. It's, a, it's an awesome existence above. It's the one. It's not a substance, it doesn't possess a unity. The best approach is through its offspring, being. 
We know it brings the intelligence into existence, that it's the source of all that is best self-sufficing. That's the begetter of every being. But since the intelligence is a numerate, a, a, a multiplicity, it's not the one. We must yet go higher. How are we then to conceive of it? I'm in chapter 6, section 6. Well, something of its unity, its oneness can be understood. See, he goes from a yoga spiritual to, a, to trying to train the mind to understand it, and to understand it prepares it for a vision, so it goes back and forth from a spiritual discipline to how to conceive of it properly. So he moves from philosophy to a spiritual discipline back and forth. Something of its oneness, its unity, can be understood from its self-sufficiency. It's necessarily the most powerful, the most self-sufficient, the most independent. For whatever is not one, but multiple needs something else. It needs unification. The one is already one. It does not even need itself. Being, it's multiple. And in order to be what it is, it needs multiplicity of things it contains. Each one of the things it contains is what it is by its union with the others and not by itself. So it needs others. One doesn't need anything. There must be something then that is fully self-sufficient. That is the one. It alone, within and without, is without need. It needs nothing outside itself, either to exist or to achieve well-being, or to be sustained in existence. It's the cause of other things. How could it owe, owe its existence to it? Other things need it. Support, foundation. What needs foundation is material mass, which unfounded falls. The one is the foundation for all things and gives them at once the same, at, and the same time existence, location, what needs locating is not self-sufficient. The one cannot aim at any good or desire anything. It's superior to good because it's the good itself. The one, therefore, in it, but the one in its aloneness can neither know nor be ignorant of anything. Being with itself, it does not need to know itself. Actually, we shouldn't even attribute to it this presence with itself if we're to preserve its unity. Therefore, the good is, in another sense, beyond all else. Therefore, the cause of all existing things cannot be one of them. Because it's the cause of good, it cannot then be called the good. Yet, in another sense, it is the good above and beyond all. If the mind reels at this, the one being none of the things we mentioned, a start yet can be made from them to contemplate it. We need a, we need a start. Okay. Another kind of yoga. All right. First, do not let yourself be distracted anything exterior, for the one is not in one place depriving all the rest of its present. It's present to all of those who can touch it, and absent only to those who cannot. No man can concentrate on one thing by thinking of some other thing, so he should not connect something else with the object he is thinking if he wishes to really grasp it. Similarly, it's impossible for the soul impressed with something else to conceive the one, so long as such an impression occupies his attention, just as, just as it's impossible that a soul, at the moment when it's attentive to other things, should receive the form of what it is that it's its contrary. Thus, we must be free of all, all externals. The soul must turn totally inward, not allowing itself to be rested back towards the outer. It must simply forget everything. Subjective first, finally the objective. It must not even know that is, is itself applying itself to contemplation of the one. Now, after having dwelled with, with this sufficiently, the soul should, if it can, 
reveal to others this transcendent community. This transcendent communion, pardon me. The divinity that's encountered is not outside any being, but on the contrary, is present to all things, though they may not know it. <laughs> They're fugitives from the divine, or rather from themselves. What they turn from, they cannot reach. Themselves lost, they can find no other. But the man who has learned to know himself will at the same time discover whence he comes. Therefore, self-knowledge is essential. I was going to cover four ideas here, right? The self is the center. You have to discover your center and then discover from that center that that is actually the center of all centers and all centers converge towards one center. So he's going to talk about the center, this finding one's own center, love, how that is truly living, and then the goal. And um, um, I like looking ahead. Okay, hey. <laughs> Self-knowledge reveals to the soul that its natural motion, not in a straight line, circular, as around some in inner object, it's about a center, the point to which it owes its origin. If the soul knows this, it will move around that center from which it came. It'll cling to it, commune with it, and indeed all souls should, but only divine souls do it. This is the secret of their divinity, for divinity consists in being attached to the center. One who withdraws from it becomes an ordinary man. Is the center of our souls then the principle we are seeking? No, no, we're after the one. But we must look for some other principle upon which all centers converge and to which only by analogy to the visible circle the word center is truly applies. Now the soul is not a circle. It's not a geometrical figure. Our meaning is that in the soul and around about it it exists, the primordial nature, that primordial nature is that from which it derives existence. Now, souls are of the intelligible realm, and the one is still above the intelligence. We're forced to say that the union of the intellect of thinking with its object proceeds from different means. Therefore, we have another goal. I'm, I'm going to take a side step for a moment because I like this. Um, what he's saying about knowledge, very interesting. But since the souls are of the intelligible realm and the one is still above the intelligence, we're forced to say that the union of the intellect of thinking being with its object proceeds by different means. The intellective thinking, being is in the presence of its object by virtue of its similarity and identity. That's it, by similarity and identity. And it's united with its kindred with nothing to separate it from them. What separates bodily, bodiless beings from one another is not spatial distance, but their own differences and diversities. When there's no difference between them, they're, they're mutually present. Now, the one doesn't contain any difference. It's always present. And we're always present to it, whether uh, when we need no longer to contain difference. As the one does not contain any difference, it's always present, and we're always present to it. When? When we no longer contain difference. The one doesn't aspire to us or move around us. We aspire and move around it. Actually, we move always around it, but we don't know how to look. We're like a chorus grouped about a conductor who allowed their attention to be distracted by the audience. If, however, they were to turn towards the conductor, they would sing as they should and would really be with them. We are always around the one. If we were not, we would dissolve and cease to exist, yet our gaze does not remain fixed upon the one. That's our task. We must dance and inspire dance around it.
Oh, it goes back to the soul for a moment. soul, then filled with divinity, light, is pregnant. This is its starting point. It's goal. It's its starting point because it's from the world above that it proceeds. It is its goal because in the world above is the good to which it aspires. Further proof that the good is in the realm above, love. It's innate in our souls. The soul different from divinity, has sprung from it. Soul must needs love. When it is in the realm above, its love is heavenly. Every soul is an Aphrodite. It is suggested in the myth of Aphrodite's birth at the same time as that of Eros. Now, love, where does it go? How great then is its bliss? Can be conceived by those who've tasted it. They, they think of earthly unions and love, marking well the joy felt by the lover who succeeds in obtaining his desires. But this is love directed to the mortal shadows. Only in the world beyond does the real object of our love exist, the only one with which we can unite ourselves and which we can have a part and which we can intimately possess without being separated by the barriers of flesh. Now, anyone who has had this experience knows what I mean, knows what I'm talking about. He will know that the soul lives another kind of life, higher, as it advances towards the one, as it reaches it, as it shares in it. The soul recognizes the presence of the dispenser of true life, recognizes it as that, needs nothing more. Then, of it and of itself, the soul has all the vision that may be. Now luminous, now filled with intellectual light, become pure light, subtle, weightless. It's become divine. It's part of the eternal that is beyond becoming. It's like a flame. Back to this. Oh. Ten. Well, why doesn't it stay there? Because it has not yet detached itself from things here below. Yet a time will come when it will uninterruptedly have vision when it will no longer be bothered by a body. Therefore, all right, now we're going back to it. When the contemplative looks upon himself in the act of contemplation, he will see himself to be like its object. He feels himself to be united to himself in the way that an object is united to itself. That is, he'll experience himself as simple. Actually, we shouldn't say he will see. What he sees is not seen, not distinguished, not, resent, not represented as a thing apart. The man who obtains the vision becomes, as it were, another being. He ceases to be himself, retains nothing of himself. Absorbed in the beyond, he's one with it. Like a center coincidental with another center. While the centers coincide, they're one. It's only in this sense that we can speak of the one as something separate. It's very difficult to describe this vision. How can we represent it? And how can we represent it as different from what, uh, what seemed while we were contemplating it not to be other than ourselves? This is doubtless is what is back of the injunction of the mystery religions which prohibit revelation to the uninitiated. The divine is not expressible, so the initiate is forbidden to speak of it to anyone who has not been fortunate enough to have beheld it himself. The vision 
The man who saw becomes identical to what he saw. Hence he doesn't see. He's rather one with it. Uh, if he could only preserve a memory of what he had seen while thus absorbed, uh, he'd possess within himself an image of what it was. In that state he had attained unity. Nothing within him or without affects diversity. When he makes his descent, when he makes his ascent, there was within him no disturbance, no anger, no emotion, desire, reason, or thought. Actually, such as an ascent, he's no longer himself. Filled with the divine, but yet he's still solitary at rest. Not returning to this side or that. He, he was at utter rest, having, so to say, become rest itself. It's in this state he, busy, he busies himself no longer, even with the beautiful. He has risen above beauty, and he's passed beyond even the choir, the choir of virtues. You have to leave beauty itself, and that's the stage he's talking about. You have to leave that, that vision. What is it like? He's like one who, penetrating the innermost sanctuary of a temple, leaves the temple images behind. Now, they'll be the first objects to strike his view coming out of the sanctuary. After this contemplation and communion, there's not with, the, there's, there's not, uh, with an image or a statue, but what they represent. So when he comes out of this, what does he return to? This. Because they're the first object to strike his view coming out of the sanctuary. Such experience is hardly a vision. It's seeing of quite a different kind. It's self-radiance. It's a pure simplification, self-abandonment, a striving for union or repose. That is to say, one sees in the sanctuary. Anyone who tries to see in any other way will see nothing. Now, it's by the use of these riddles that the wise among the soothsayers expressed in riddles how the divinity is seen. Now, a wise priest reading the riddle will, once uh, arrived in the realm beyond, achieve a true vision of the sanctuary. One who has not yet arrived and knows the sanctuary, and knows the sanctuary is uh, invisible is the source and principle of everything. That person, right? He will know. Know what? That by hypothesis is hypothesis known. Pardon me. I always do that. He will know that by hypostasis is hypostasis seen. And that like the alone joins the like. He'll leave aside nothing of the divine the soul is capable of acquiring. If his vision is incomplete, He'll attend to its completion. Completion is the one itself. It's not in the soul's nature to attain, to utter nothingness. Falling into evil, it falls into nothingness. When it reverses direction, it arrives not at something different, but at itself. Thus. When it is not in anything, it is in nothing but itself. Yet, when it is in itself alone and not in being, that's the supreme. We then transcend being by virtue of the soul with which we are united. Now, if you look upon yourself in this state, you'll find yourself an image of the one. If you rise beyond yourself, as an image rising to its model, you'll reach the goal of your journey. When you fall from this vision, you will, by arousing the virtue within yourself and by remembering the perfection that you possess, regain that likeness. And through virtue, rise to the excellence and through wisdom, attain to the one. Such is the life of divinity and of the divine and blessed men. Detachment from all things here below, 
scorn for all earthly pleasures. It's the flight of the lone to the alone. So that's what I wanted to take you through. And now, let me throw it open. I myself want to tell you I always enjoy every chance I can reading Plotinus, so it's a great pleasure to be able to share it with you. Yes? What about the tension, the mystery? Oh, well, um, you have to go beyond beauty, don't you? And that's a tension. That's a mystery. That's a tension. What is it like? What do you think it's like experiencing finally a real being? Now you know the ultimate reality. Now you have an ecstasy. Now you're in a state of bliss. Now you know the nature of the mind is equivalent to what it is you're experiencing. There's no difference between the subject and the object. Right? There's a true oneness. Wait a minute, there's something beyond that. About which you can't say anything. You can't even say nothing about it, because that suggests nothingness. And therefore there's a great tension about this mystery. Is there no? Yeah, you created some tension. Yeah, good. <laughs> David? Well, I guess what, uh, on, on the one hand, it seems as though Plotinus has contemplated the one, but then on the other hand, it, it, it seems as though that he always talks about the one in context uh, with many, uh, uh, with being. Yes. As, this is a manyness. Something That's right. distinct from mm -hmm. the one. Mm -hmm. and, and then another character that shows up uh, is the soul. And so, mm -hmm. um, it would, I guess, in my own. Mm -hmm. My own, I guess, contemplation, if I can say that, uh, it seems as though that uh, being, intelligence, uh, and the soul uh, are too many, uh, too many to, to exist with the one. That's right. You're quite right. That's why it's separate and distinct from it. Absolutely right. But Therefore, it's, it's always separated from it, contrasted from it. Yeah. But but again, even in that, even in that, mm -hmm. and maybe there's a maybe the, the grammar of our language limits mm -hmm. us. But when you when you say that they are separate and distinct from the one, mm -hmm. it makes like the one is just another name for some other. Even though we attribute. Uh, we attribute transcendental qualities to it, but in but in the final analysis, it winds up being just one of many, and which make it contradicts its own name. Yeah. See, so, uh, this is a unity. This is a one of many. That's right. right. Man has a struggle to unify himself, or the soul must be unified. Right. Certainly, that's another kind of one. Yeah. When this is unified, that's the condition for experiencing this. It's through this that one then can talk about an experience of this. These are different ideas of one, aren't they? This is a different kind of unity. The parts of the psyche, you know, depending, right? Reason, right? The spirited part of man, right? And the desires or appetites, right? Those are the, what we often call the parts of the soul. But when they are then unified, that's the condition for this. The, the most difficult thing and the point you're raising, as I understand you, 
is whether or not this is empty, just a distinction, just a, a term thrown around without any meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it has no qualities you can assign to it. You can't say anything about it as much as we talked, as much as Plotinus described it. Uh, let me even go further. In this experience, in this experience, it's impossible to conceive of anything more real or more beautiful. It's simply impossible. It, it therefore, it's considered, therefore, ultimate reality. That's what it's called. Bang. It's impossible to conceive of anything greater. The only difficulty, then, is if someone then can move from this to this, they're in a rather curious and interesting situation that they that there's something they recognize is greater than this, but they can't say anything about it. Because you can't say anything about it. But you can't say anything about it because no term in any way or any, any form can describe it. That's different than this, in one sense. The superlative terms you might be able to use to describe this are pushing the upper limits of language when you get into terms like ecstasy and bliss and luminous and divine radiance and this kind of language, you're pushing the upper limits. Here, yeah. get beyond it. Yeah, yeah, please. No, no, no I don't want to come back later. Yeah, okay. Oh, I thought I had, yes, please. Oh, yeah, so yeah. There, there, you, can, you, can, you can be that state that which, which one? From, from beauty to the one. There's, a, there's actually a movement that wants to go through. It, is that right? Because if that's so, uh, that that uh, that happened to me on Saturday, and I didn't and I didn't know it till tonight. Well, it, um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but um, this is a game where you have to be careful about the language that is used mm -hmm. and to make sure that the language that you use matches your experience so that analysis then can be made cautiously and with all of that. Because uh, I think the easiest way to express this is that uh, in the Buddhist world, including Plotinus, but in the Buddhist world, there eight kinds, you can distinguish eight kinds of enlightenment experiences. And in Tozan, five major ways of describing profound experiences. And I think what they, both of these system, Tozan and the ox herding pictures would ask you to talk about this one word, movement, at some time. I don't know whether you're open to it now or later, but uh, that's the way it would go. There is a movement from one. In what way is it a movement? Well, I, uh, well initially I was absorbing into my hara the chakra right below my navel, and there was surges of uh, light energy uh, rippling upwards. They say surges, but they were huge. Uh, they were all encompassing, and then they came out the top of my head, and suddenly there was nothing but a pure shaft of light through the middle of everything. And I was being elevated yeah. uh, upwards yeah. into that light. And, yeah. then, and then there was, uh, there wasn't any light. Hmm? There was nothing but emptiness. There was a void. It was, uh, it was a God state of mind. I, I don't know. It was, it was a God so state of mind. Why, why would you say it's a state of mind? It wasn't a state of mind. Huh? It was beyond all states of mind. Yeah, well, so you, I can only deal with what you said. I know, that's right. That's right, that's um, what I said. That was inaccurate. Well, um, when, could you talk about, you're, you're now interested, I presume, in talking about the transition from this to this yeah. to the idea of the one. And you were going to use this language, there's a movement from this to that. So could you talk about that? The light was a state of mind. Light was being vitality and uh, intelligence on the highest possible level I've ever experienced in my uh, in my memory. It was just pure radiance, pure light, and uh, that was that was mind. It was mind stuff, mind substance. Um, 
Yeah, okay. It's movement in it. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's movement in it. Yeah, upwards. Okay, okay, look here. Elevation. Yeah, okay, look here. Upwards, elevation. Yeah, put more words on it. And, uh, a removal from a lower state. Uh, yeah, that's there, okay. Higher and higher degrees of bliss and beauty. And then nothingness. Um, why do you use that word? Because there wasn't a, there wasn't a sense of bliss anymore. There wasn't anybody. There wasn't anything. Yeah, I know. Why do you use the word emptiness? Why, why do you use that word? Or nothingness. Huh? Or nothingness. Yeah. Excuse me. Because there, were, there was it, it was just like you said. There was absolutely nothing that could be said about it. Nothing that could be distinguished within it. There was absolutely no sense of uh, separation and multiplicity. Not even uh, what I was experiencing in the beauty. Yeah, and uh, what did you do? I reeled. Hmm? <laughs> My reel. I reeled. Huh? I, it was, it, I started labeling what was going on, and I came back into the solar system. I came back and I saw the city around. I was I was up above Huntington Beach, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. looking at uh, uh, buildings and people moving about. It was Saturday mm -hmm. night, and, and then suddenly um, I, I thought that uh, I could recreate my whole physical existence. Yeah. And and that was I was back in the body. Then. I thought mm -hmm. that I could recreate step by step the things that I wanted to be my mm -hmm. physical life. Uh, but that was a false thought I had mm -hmm. nothing to do. I mean, I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're very fortunate. I think it's an interesting out of body experience. But um, um, you, you'll enjoy taking another look at Plotinus and seeing whether what you're saying matches that or whether it's an out of body experience. And you can judge that and take a look. Well, there was an out of body experience? Yeah, this is. Was yeah, one. very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, sir. You know, um, I've not read much of the ideas, but from from the little I have read and from reading some secondary sources, um, I, I, I want to know if my understanding of the one is any in, in Plotinus is anywhere similar to your understanding. When I tend to read about it, I my sense is that he is talking about the totality, the experience of the totality of all that is in the one. But I'm curious if your reading of Plotinus is anywhere near that or something entirely different. Do I first do I, do I have your meaning right? I'm sorry. Do I have your do I have do I have what you've just said? Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, a totality of all that is. The experience of. Okay, the experience of the totality of all that is. Yes. Now, uh, um, I think you appreciate the fact that in this game we're very interested in uh, certain key words. How, how would you talk about this word of all that is? Well, um, I would probably speak of it as all of, of reality. All right. Now, see, the word all that is, that can be all that comes into being and passes out. Right? That often takes on the word becoming. Right? Anything that comes into existence and later passes out of existence, that's the word becoming. And in this game, when the authors are speaking most accurately, they use this word, existence. 
Now, um, does your idea of totality include this? One, two, three. Does it include that? Well, I'm not sure I understand those three things that you just pointed to. Um, well, that's the first thing you just pointed to. Okay. There is said to be, through the spiritual discipline, a way of experiencing the nature of reality. Now that's not becoming, that's being. All right. In that experience, one recognizes that the very foundation, the very source of oneself is no different than that ultimate reality one recognizes in that that the being that is encountered is no other than mind, capital M. Why capital M? It is an astonishing, the reason why they call it mind and intelligence, one of the reasons, is because we've all experienced insights. If you can take the most profound insight you've ever had and talk about what does it do to you to have it, Hold on to that experience. This experience of the nature of being, immediately you recognize that that is pure intuition. That, therefore, being is mind as an active, active intuition, which has a vast vitality to it, that's analytic terms, but it's experienced as, phenomenologically, as a splendor, a luminous radiance, divine luminosity. That's so overwhelming that in it, it is impossible to conceive of anything more beautiful. Therefore, it's called beauty itself. Now, when you say the totality of all that is, does it include that? Yes, uh, potentiality, or potentiality, essence, Yes. Okay. Then, see, we could say all existence, all right? We can talk about all being, all right? And what Plotinus wants to say is that these are interesting distinctions, but the one, the one, <laughs> Is, a, as, is at one time beyond all of that, transcendental, transcendental to all of that, yet anything that has existence must have existence because it is one. There is a oneness about it. When it loses its oneness, it loses its, its being, it loses its existence, it falls apart. Right? It, it enters into the realm of dispersal. Therefore, there is a oneness throughout all existence and this experience. And the source of that is the one itself, which is not in experience or being, but is the source of it both. If, if that, I hope I didn't talk too much. So the, that, language, that language suggests that this is happening in time, that there, that it, that, uh, uh, that the one erases uh, all existence and all being in time, but it seemed, but it, but it would seem that all existence and all being never actually exist. It's only, it's only something. It's only a, a fantasy or an illusion that that appears to be real until mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. come to the come in, come in contact with the one or we realize the one and I guess a, 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 I guess a, a reciprocal to that is that in the totality of all that is the uh, all suggests a in my own mind, it suggests it suggests a collection of things right. that through some harmonic. That's right. That's right. 
achieves that's right. unity. That's right. But that's not the one. That's not the one. That's right. That's right. Right. That to totality would say that's the greatest collection you can have, or the greatest unity, the unity of all unities. You know. Yes, that's true. It's not the one, but it's the source of it. Yeah, that's you, right. Oh, you said that this is the source of the one. No, the source is the, the one is the source of all all unities. Mm. Okay, that's that's so, to me that's that's where the contradiction occurs. You say that the one is the source of something else, then we have created a duality, and the one the one is in, in my own thinking the one can can be the only thing, the only the only reality. No. Is the one no, no. and everything else no. is a duality. Does not yeah. exist. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's the way you're posing it. That's right. Absolutely right. That is the way you're posing it. Now the question is whether that represents Plotinus. Because in other words, what you're saying makes a great deal of sense. All right. Now we have to see whether that is what he's saying and whether he can escape what yeah. What conclusion we would draw? So my question oh, yes, is, yes. It does, it, on one hand, it does seem as though he's saying that, but but on the other hand, it seems as though mm -hmm. he's, he talks about the soul, being, intelligence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even man. Yes. As if as if man, soul, being, and intelligence have real being. Well, okay, hold on. They have being, but right, see, what you want to say is they have a derived being from being. Soul has a derived being from being. Put it this way, all right? In, see, notice the way we have this, all right? All existence, everything in this room that's visible. If you are right here at the time, in this experience, th this would not be known to you. All that would be known would be this. There isn't any opposition. There isn't any opposition. Only when you step out of it and make comparisons, but in it there's no opposition. Uh, when you talk about the nature of the one itself, right, one comes to uh, one startling realization and that is that that is the source of this. Now, I don't think there's any way logically you can ever bring anybody to see that. I mean, it's just, I'd like to have someone devise an argument where they might be able to show it, but from this, the one, to be able to explain how the overflowing, as it were, of the one produces this, and how this in turn is responsible for the existence of soul and the everyday world in which we live, um, I think it's easier to talk about the lower steps than the transition from the one to this. That's well, astonishing. I mean, that's all just, that's fundamentally astonishing. Um, now, let me go back to that, all right? Just as in this experience, all existence is no longer an opposition. It's not even part of one's experience. In the same way, when one reaches this, curiously enough, that does not wipe out all of this. It doesn't exclude it. See, the, um, the uh, important concept that we want to see is in the discussion we had a short while ago from our colleague, right, who was talking about this word nothingness, right? Um, what is so important about the one? What is it? The only, the only thing you can say about it, the only one thing you can say about it, um, is that whatever that is, anything that is a one, that's one. That's pure one. That's the one. And let me go further. 
I don't think there's any way in which it can be explained. I have tried. Um, see if I can do this this way, make it clear even to myself. All right. Let us get, as if we can, the purest description of the one. What is the relationship between that and any particular thing we call a one? There is only, see, and we might be able to grade these things. We might be able to grade them as possessing more or less of oneness. And you know what we're going to come up with? Just that one statement, which is uh, quite astonishing. Um, Everything that is called one has a unity proportionate to its nature, sharing in unity either more or less according to the degree of its being. So you can rank these things and you can see they have more or less unity depending upon their being. But let us, but the thing that we want to talk about is what is the connection between this and this? And there's only one possible connection that I know of. And that is, in this experience, it is one. It is one. You can talk about it. Splendor, luminous, radiance, divine luminosity. Hey, you know what? It's one. It's continuous. It's one. One. One ocean. One of this, it's a one, it's a one, it's a one, it's a one, it's a one. The most profound one, it's a one. That's right, you can say about it, it's one. By gosh, it's one. Now that's the connection you can make between these two. That that's the highest, that's the highest degree to which anything can be said can participate in unity as being. That's this, when it's experienced. That's a oneness. Why is it a oneness? Because there is nothing in it that you can find distinctions within it, though you can find aspects of it on analysis. It is a homogeneous, as it were, oneness with dynamic aspects. Well, that's a very profound oneness. See, being is a oneness. And if you have been exploring philosophy and talking about the nature of one, the most disillusioning thing to come to, if you're in this game, is to have this experience and realize it's not the one. It is a one and a oneness. Therefore, you have to go beyond it. Is that, it like in the Book of the Dead, when they talk about the Dark Is that the... Uh, well, the... Uh, the uh, Chikai, the Chikai, uh, uh, the Chikai Bardo plane, or well, I should just the Bardo, where the Bardo is playing, all right, uh, is this experience, all right? That's, but the Dharmakaya is the unity is the unity of this, let me, let me call that L, all right, or the light, all right? And pure awareness. So that in this experience, they're saying, hey, you know what's present? Awareness. The unity being able to identify the unity of these two, that's the Dharma Kaya. Kaya body, Dharma, the body of truth. So that's not like A1. That's Well, um, see here, that's a 
that's a stage between these two because this is a unity right necessarily it's a unity and they talk about the inseparable uh, pure awareness and the divine luminosity as the Dharmakaya so a Platonist would come along or from Plotinus and say that's a very profound experience by the way I can locate it between this and this, which is somewhat discouraging if you're a Buddhist. Yeah. Can quantum physics be understood in the language, in the language of Plotinus? And if so, who? who? Pardon me? Can quantum physics be understood in the language of Plotinus? And if oh. so, how? I'm glad to hear that. He needs it. Yes, he needs it, Ken. Oh, pardon me. Did you say can physics? Can quantum physics? Quantum physics. Be understood? Well, there are many people who are playing that game at this point, and they're doing some remarkable work. Okay, can you give us a demonstration of it in the language of Plotinus, how they can be reconciled or, or, or not? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you start. Well, I'll it, tell it, you what, I have no, one you thing see, in mind, and that was no, you see, you. in physics, light is a major concept. It's, a, it's a, called the fifth dimension, right? And there's a whole theory about Calusa, Klein, and their understanding of light as a fifth dimension, and that would take us a while. But, uh, I'll point you in a direction. You used the, an example of uh, an orchestra. See that yes. little picture of the guy? Yes. Right, going in mm -hmm. unity union, and you draw the arrow towards it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Being vitality and mm -hmm. uh, that word above it, I can't read that. Um, intelligence. Yeah, intelligence. And you used an example of an orchestra, right? The many different people within the orchestra. Yeah, right? most often people are looking at the audience rather right. than the conductor. So, right. what I'm thinking of is bringing it down to the subatomic level, like. Yeah, go ahead. I would say I so, would encourage her. Can you do that? Well, okay. So can you give us an example in the language of Plotinus about how you would instead instead of using the word orchestra, use the word atom? Um, no. No. Um, Why? Well, oh, because I'd have to shift gears, and I don't want to shift gears. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind trying it some other time, but okay. um, I think I need a certain space. I don't think I have it, all right. and I think I'd have to reflect on it. I think, first of all, I think it's a very good question. Uh, I flirted with it. I haven't taken it as seriously as I should, though I have approached it. I think there are some people who are doing it. Mm -hmm. I think they can probably do it better than I can, okay. but I'd be willing to take a look at it. All yeah, right. sir. Um, you should give the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. My mind is no, really right. about thinking about it. Yeah. I have a linguistic question. He uses the word vision. Yes. And normally in modern English, the connotation of vision mm. is well, it's only a vision, etc. Mm. It mm. vision becomes unreal. So mm. he's writing Greek, not Latin, right? Mm -hmm. What is the connotation of the word vision that he is using? Oh, um, well, I don't know what word he's using. Now you sure, Plotinus? Um, I presume it's uh, noesis. No, I presume he's not using it in... I don't know, often I'd have to... In, in modern English, since we don't like mysticism of any kind, you know, as soon as you talk about a vision, it kind of, oh, it's only a vision, you know, it's your imagination. Only a vision. Here, you, that language would not be I know, I'm just, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, curious yeah, linguistically, yeah. what is the... Yeah, the I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah, I'll take a look for it. Yeah, gladly. Anything else before we um, take I a look? Just one com I want to add one comment. Yes, please. Also, the interesting thing to me was that as we get to the um, divine luminosity, the object subject dichotomy disappeared totally because yes, that's true. And that was this that's right other unity that we achieved even though it's not the one but we yes. do get rid of dualities anyway at that mm -hmm. level quite true um, 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 
it always it also talks about vision of a different kind. Uh, he used that language twice. Um, let me look for it while I. Yeah, my please. question uh, is simply: uh, Is there one or two books on uh, the problem of the one and the many in Greek thought that you've come across in your years mm -hmm. of study that uh, you consider better than others? Uh, and if so, the titles or authors? Oh yeah, uh, I would really recommend the essential Platonists. Okay, secondary but, source. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't read oh, okay. secondary sources. That would kind of summarize the yeah. materials uh, like uh, those um, Proclus's commentary on Plato's Parmenides is essential. Uh, his elements of theology and uh, yeah, those are secondary but let's see, who does, I, I don't even know any moderns who, uh, I, I must confess I, I don't get into contemporary thought as I should, but um, I don't, uh, I should, but I don't, because I've got a lot of reading to do. Yeah, well, I'm trying to, you know, I even bought new glasses, thinking that I could speed read faster. So you put this Dora Machia state in between being vitality and intelligence in the one? That threw me off. I didn't yeah, have to do I noticed. <laughs> if you put a word I mean, to it, well, it's between, it's not the one. It's not the one. If it's a unity of two, it's not the one. Fear. A unity of two. Yeah, Who sure. Wouldn't you say a person should read Plato's Parmenides? Yeah. Pardon? Plato's Parmenides would be Plato's Parmenides. Parmenides. He wants secondary sources. Yeah, secondary, though. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't know the secondary sources until you read them yeah. first. Yeah. Well, it depends on your approach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was time you have. Classic copy. Yeah. <laughs> Classic what? I like that. <laughs> 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 um, right. Now, in all fairness, I, I would say that Latinus on this on this section on the good and the one, um, I was comparing it with uh, uh, Thomas Taylor who's really a great source for this. And there's whole sections in here that really could be clearer when you're making distinctions, especially between these two and the passage. And so I would, would be nice to get something that could be that clear, modern or ancient, that could you know, focus much more clarity on that issue. Uh, so, um, yeah, anything? Please. Eighty-seven. Please. Actually, we should not say he will Identical see what he, saw. what he sees. In case it is still possible to distinguish here, seer and the seen, to assert that the two are one would be indeed rash. It is not seen not distinguished, not represented as a thing apart. The man who attains the vision becomes, as it were, another being. Yeah. So that's one yeah. of the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Greek. You're looking for the Greek. Go ahead. That'll help. Yeah, there's Second some. Yeah. Number 10. Yeah. Number 10. Ha. Ah. I'm with you. The aim. Hmm. 
That won't help. Um, Yes, it is, from knowledge. Not from knowledge. It's uh, the aim, which is the uh, uh, divining. That's the higher vision, the aim, to contemplate. It should be contemplating. So right? instead of vision or hallucination, yeah, you yeah. want to say divining. Yeah. So it's a different kind of seeing. Yeah, that, that's... Divining. Yeah. Right. I was thinking that Mm-hmm. He's talking about in those sentences, you know, object subject differentiation disappearing, and then he's using the word vision, and it didn't sound quite congruous. But divination happens between. Pardon me? Divination happens in that between realm. Yeah, yeah, yes, that uh, certainly does. Um, um, let's see, let me ask you. Um, in that light experience, did you uh, know you were experiencing the light? I was the light. Yeah, I know. Were you aware of the fact that you were experiencing the light? You were the light? <laughs> I, I'll say yes, but uh, I find that dangerous. You find it what? <laughs> there was no body. I mean, find it what? I was experiencing dangerous. the light, but I was no, What's that? Danger us? <laughs> Danger us. <laughs> well, risk it. Okay. <laughs> No limited self. Yeah, There's yeah. No multiplicity yeah. in it except yeah. for the yeah. distinctions you can make. Yeah. 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 By the way, was there, some, was there something aware of that? Yeah. Oh, good, good. How would you describe it? It was, not, it was like my little mind had become one with big mind. Oh, so there's an awareness then of that difference, big, big mind. Uh, yeah. yeah, little mind yeah. was uh, yeah. uh, looking, at, uh, mm. looking, at, looking at things through the sense realm or, or, or thinking things, having a, a multiplicity of images. Uh, the big mind was uh, this beauty, luminous radiance, uh, yeah. uh, pure light. Yeah. yeah, what was aware of it again? Mm-hmm. It was mind itself. No, I, why would you call it was mind itself? What what led you to that? See, in this game, all right, you want to respect the person's experience. They have to match it as closely as they can with an available language, and and you you want to be sensitive enough to make sure that the language fits. You don't want to distort it by perhaps they're not using language with the precision that you would like. Or all of these questions come up when you want to talk about and analyze these experiences. But it requires that finally when, when you put it out. So thank you very much. appreciate it.